now for our keynote address entitled Eating Economics Better, Why a Varied Diet of Economic Ideas is Important for a Healthy Economy and a Democratic Polity, we are honoured to have with us a renowned author and professor of economics at the SOAS University of London, Professor Ha Jun Chang. To introduce him, please welcome Hisham Hamdan, Executive Director and Head of Public Markets, Kazana. Good morning. Really good to see all our Kazana friends this morning. It's been three years, so thank you for coming to our KMF. And before we start, I'd like to thank Nick Kaur, Sher, and Amelia and her team and their team for being able to put our program after three years of absence. So I'm going to move on very quickly so that Professor Harjun will have more time. Uh, and then we should have about 15 minutes for Q&A. And we're really privileged uh, to, to have him here again. And um, we have had him twice before, in 2014 and 2018. And he's going to launch a new book. And in the last 15 years, I've never finished reading any book. But Arjun, proud to say over three days, you know, I finished reading this book. And it's been it's an incredible book, I, I must say that. Um, and it is, you know, I get it, I get it completed, so I'm, should, I should, I'm proud of myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to move quickly. Hajun's um, born in Korea, and he spent 36 years in Cambridge. Hajun, that long? Now he's moved uh, to SOAS, School of Oriental and African Studies in UCL London. He specialized in development economics. So for us as a country, uh, we need to really think how do we harness the strength of free markets and the role of government in helping to develop our country's capability. Why should we care? And we know that laborers and employees are complaining about their wages. The government is not collecting enough taxes for our revenue, government budget and shareholders are not getting their proper return. So I have a lot of empathy to my fellows, you know, board directors, senior management, CEOs. It's not easy um, to manage your companies, I understand that, in the environment, in the current market environments. Why should we care? Look at our uh, fund managers here, our shareholders return, KLCI has gone back to 2008 level. It's below 1,400. So that means the only return shareholders get are probably from dividend yield between 2 to 4% a year. Versus S&P 500, sort of up to December last year, roughly about 13 to 15%. And US dollars, the return obviously becomes zero, right? Why should we care? In terms of investment, more like capital investment, a percentage of GDP has gone down below 20%. That's how you like maintenance, right? So sort of maintenance capex. So I guess a chicken and egg issue for companies and extension shareholders. If I don't get return, why should I invest? And so these are things that hopefully, Hajun, uh, you can teach us a bit. The development of other countries. Um, industrial policies, um, and not just to listen to free markets, right? And some of you who have been watching or rather have asset in London, and you can watch what quasi quarting has done to the pounds. On that note, Hajun, please. You know, thank you. Thank you, Hisham, uh, for that very kind introduction. Okay. Do we, yeah. okay, today I'm going to talk about this book, uh, which is uh, officially released only on the 20th of October. So you are getting world premiere <laughs> of this book. 
And I cannot think of a better place to talk about this book uh, the, in world premiere because uh, Kazana Megatrends Forum has been one of the most important global forums for knowledge sharing and exchange. It is uh, different from other similar forums where the masters of universe are so-called from a narrow range of professions and background come to pontificate. Yeah? This is a, a, a unique forum in that you have people from so many different backgrounds, so many different professions, so many different uh, academic disciplines coming together, really the, the talking to each other, learning from each other. So I cannot think of a better place uh, the, to uh, give uh, the world premiere of uh, the, this book which uh, starts with uh, my personal story. You know, back in 1986, when it took 24 hours uh, to go from Korea to England because of the Cold War, you know, capitalist planes uh, from South Korea couldn't fly over uh, China and Russia, not to speak of North Korea. So we first had to fly to Alaska, nine hours, two hours at uh, refueling, another nine hours, but not to London, to Paris, and then change planes from there. And when I arrived there to study economics as a graduate student at the University of uh, Cambridge, it was very difficult. You know, my spoken English was uh, poor. I still have a very thick uh, Korean accent, but uh, at the time uh, it was I mean, very difficult even to string a sentence together. Racial and cultural prejudices were rampant, and the weather was rubbish. <laughs> yeah, I still remember that, that, that month that, that when I finished my final exam for my master's degree, June of 1987, it rained 28 days out of 30. Eh? But the most uh, difficult thing for me was the food. Eh? You know, before coming to Britain, I had not realized that food could taste so bad. Huh? <laughs> you know, everything was overcooked and bland, you know. Anything that was considered foreign was avoided with the religious devotion. And for me, at least, the state of British food at the time is epitomized in the, the, by this uh, pizza chain called Pizza Land which gave its customers the option to have their pizzas topped with a baked potato. <laughs> because they thought that, that uh, people would be traumatized by this uh, foreign food like pizza, so they, they need a security blanket in the form of a uh, baked potato. Well, you know, when you think about it, this is uh, ridiculous because a uh, potato is not native to Britain, yeah? It ca came from Peru, yeah? And initially, a lot of uh, British people thought uh, potatoes are uh, 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 poisonous and uh, refused to eat it. Yeah? But never mind, I mean, that's uh, the, the, what uh, they were doing. But the most uh, difficult thing uh, food-wise was that Britain's national enemy number one food-wise was garlic, yeah? which is the essence of life for Koreans. Yeah? No, actually, the, the, the book starts with the foundation myth of Korea in which garlic plays the most critical role. Yeah? So you have to the, 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 the read the book to find out. Yeah? You know, Koreans go through 7.5 kilograms of garlic per person per year. Yeah? You know, people think, oh, the, the French are the garlic eaters. No, they only eat uh, 200 grams. The Italians are 600 grams, yeah? So we are kind of garlic monsters, yeah? <laughs> and yeah, I learned that, you know, that, that, that eating garlic was uh, considered rude uh, to other people in Britain. You know, the queen uh, disliked uh, the garlic so much that uh, when Ever, uh, whenever she is a uh, resident in Windsor, or Buckingham, or the many of her residences, uh, no one was allowed to eat garlic in the building. Yeah. So, yes, uh, the, I had uh, the, a lot of difficult time. 
But the food scene in Britain is actually completely different today. It is very diverse. People eat a lot of foreign food. And uh, even British food itself has been kind of upgraded that, uh, thanks to competition from lots of uh, different foreign food. My theory is that somewhere in the late 1990s, the Brits had uh, this uh, collective epiphany yeah? that their food sucks. Yeah? <laughs> and once you, <laughs> once you admit that uh, your own food sucks, a huge uh, horizon of possibilities open up. Yeah? Because once you ta 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 give up your own ta food, I mean, why should you prefer Mexican over Korean or Indian over ta Chinese? Yeah? Anything tastes is fine. Yeah? You go to London today, ta, you have uh, such a diverse range of foods from Uzbekistan, you know, Azerbaijan, you know, not to speak of yeah? Korean, Mexican, you know. It's uh, uh, wonderful. Huh? Now, unfortunately, while my food universe was uh, expanding rapidly, my other universe, uh, that is uh, economics, was being sucked into a black hole. You know, until the 1980s, several different traditions in economics uh, coexisted. And actually, as I discussed uh, in my previous book, uh, Economics, the User's Guide, there are at least uh, nine main traditions in economics, and easily 20 if you include uh, some of the smaller schools and split up uh, the, the bigger schools into sub-schools. So until the 70s, these schools interacted uh, with each other, yeah? usually competing with each other, sometimes engaging in a death match. Yeah? The famous uh, the death match uh, between Hayek and uh, Keynes, for example. Yeah? Often learning from each other, stealing from each other, and occasionally being fused into a new theory. Yeah? So it was a very exciting scene that, uh, that uh, like, the food scene in Britain today. Huh? I mean, recently I went to this uh, Korean-Mexican fusion restaurant in London, which was uh, that, uh, set up, they might have uh, studied in the LA in America, set up by two chefs, uh, the one of whom had a Chinese name and another had a uh, 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 Hispanic name. Yeah? So that, uh, that's the kind of scene we had uh, before the 80s, but unfortunately since the 1980s, one school of economics known as neoclassical school of economics has come to dominate the subject almost completely. Yeah? So in most countries, when people say economics, they mean neoclassical economics. Yeah? I'm not saying that this school is uh, particularly bad. You know, that like all other schools, it has uh, its uh, strengths and weaknesses. Yeah? Uh, yeah, sorry, that this is another newer cover of uh, the book. Uh, uh, yeah, you cannot really see it here, but that, uh, you know, in the book uh, I uh, explain how they have uh, different strengths and weaknesses because uh, they are interested in different things, yeah? Some of them are more interested in market exchange, like uh, the neoclassical school. Others are more interested in production, like the developmentalist school or the classical school, yeah? They theorize the economy in different ways. They have different assumptions in terms of politics and ethics. Yeah? So actually in judging what is a social improvement, they have different views, yeah? even if it's the same economic phenomenon. Yeah? Unfortunately, the domination by one school has uh, narrowed this subject, making it boring and unhealthy, like the British uh, food scene up to the mid-1990s. Yeah? Let me give you some examples. Uh, for example, neoclassical economics regards self-seeking, pursuit of self-interest, as the most important, if not the only, aspect of uh, human nature. Yeah? Now, does it matter whether they do or not? It does. because. When this uh, particular view of economics uh, 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 dominates, P 
people get to believe that everyone is selfish, yeah? which then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah? Because enough people, that, that if enough people believe that everyone else is out to promote himself or herself, they will not cooperate with each other. Yeah? And then it becomes yeah, a self-fulfilling prophecy. For another example, the neoclassical school believes that the value of everything should be determined by the market. So it has um, made this school that, uh, and, and uh, the, by extension, most of uh, economists uh, today ignore activities that exist outside the market, yeah? such as care work and household work done at home in communities, mostly by women. Yeah? So I have a chapter called Chile, where I explain the, the, the problem with this view. And it's not just that uh, in terms of uh, the gender issues, I mean, this market-based valuation of human activities has also led to an absurd situation during the pandemic. Yeah? During the pandemic, many countries designated healthcare workers, school teachers, people working in the, the uh, supermarkets, uh, people producing food, people delivering uh, food and uh, other essentials as key workers, as they were called in Britain, or essential employees, that, uh, as uh, they were called in America. Yeah? So the societies that are declaring that these are the most important people for our survival. Yeah? However, according to the market, these people, except uh, a handful of uh, the, the top medical doctors, are actually not very valuable people, yeah? because they are all kind of uh, the, the poorly paid people. Yeah? You know, the world that uh, the, the road ahead uh, without yeah? uh, the, the giving regard to this, yeah? this fundamental contradiction. Yeah? On the one hand, you say that these are the most important people. On the other hand, because you rely solely on market, I mean, I'm not saying that we shouldn't rely on market, but that, that if you, because you rely solely on the market the signals, you are also saying that you are worthless. Yeah? You are the least that are necessary people. Yeah? Last but not least, uh, neoclassical economics starts its analysis after taking the existing distribution of income, wealth, and power as given, so it is inherently bad at challenging the status quo. I mean, I don't have time to elaborate on this, but those, who, those of you who had the economics education would have heard about the Pareto yeah, uh, optimality, and that is basically taking everything as given and then trying to see whether you can make at least some people better off without making others uh, worse off. Huh? I mean, uh, nothing wrong with that, but problem is that uh, this is uh, taking the existing you know, the social order as given. Huh? So it becomes very conservative. Huh? So the dominance of uh, neoclassical economics because of this uh, has meant that economics is now playing the role of Catholic theology in medieval Europe. Yeah? It has become an ideology that tells people that the world is what it is because it has to be. Yeah? However unjust, uh, wasteful, yeah? and, and inefficient it may look. Yeah? Now, you may ask yourself uh, that after hearing all this, why should I, I'm a medical doctor, I'm an uh, accountant, I'm an engineer, yeah? I'm a community worker, why should I that, uh, care about economics? Yeah? That's for economists. Yeah? After all, I mean, they are, these are people who emphasize uh, division of labor. Yeah? But I argue that you all should care about what happens to economics because like it or not, economics has become the language of power. Yeah? This is a language that is uh, spoken by people 
who control the world, and you cannot change the world without understanding it. Yeah? And I put it even more strongly and argue that in a capitalist economy, democracy is meaningless without all citizens doing at least some economics. Yeah? You know, these days, uh, the, the, because of the dominance of this uh, market-oriented economics, everything is uh, the, supposed to be justified in terms of its uh, economic impact, yeah? whether it's uh, literature or the, some traditional culture or health. You know, in Britain, I have uh, often met uh, these people who try to justify the monarchy in terms of the tourist revenue it generates. Yeah? You know, I'm not a monarchist, but what a uh, demeaning uh, way of uh, the honoring uh, the, the institution that you believe in. Yeah? Poor is revenue. Yeah? yeah, this is what the, 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 the economics is doing to the world. Yeah? Everything has to be justified in terms of money. Yeah? So, really, I mean, in this kind of world, you need to know economics if you want to understand what's going on if you want to influence our collective decision. You know, otherwise, uh, the, the democratic politics becomes like a, I don't know, the, the beauty contest, yeah? You know, I still remember that in the 2000 American election, a lot of people voted for George W. Bush saying that, oh, he looks like a kind of guy that I could have a beer with, yeah? Gosh, that, uh, what a way to that, that decide that, uh, who occupies the most important political office in the world, yeah? You know, we, we should not uh, let that happen, yeah? And because uh, the, I believe in the importance of economic knowledge for a healthy economy and democratic politics, I have taken it upon myself uh, in the last uh, 15 years or so to be an advocate of uh, the, what I call mass economic literacy, yeah? Taking sorry, that, that bringing that, that, that economics to people, yeah? And this uh, book is uh, the, my latest attempt to entice people into thinking about and learning economics. Yeah? Because I accept that the economics is boring, yeah? It takes a bit of effort uh, to get used to it, yeah? So I'm uh, trying to bribe uh, my readers with stories of our food, yeah? Yeah, but uh, this is uh, the, the, the greatest uh, bribe because I give the bribe first, and if you don't like uh, the, the, the rest of it, you don't have to read it, yeah? But uh, this is not a book about economics of food, yeah? How food is produced, how it's uh, traded, how it's uh, consumed and wasted, yeah? The food stories usually, although not always, have nothing to do with the main economic <laughs> stories. Yeah? I'll explain a bit that, that, uh, in a minute. Yeah? So each chapter is named after a food ingredient. You know, garlic, chocolate, chili, prawn, acorn. You didn't know that uh, you could eat acorn, yeah? Koreans do. Find out how, yeah? And each chapter starts with some stories about that food item. Yeah? So it could be about its biology. In some cha chapters, it's about uh, its origin and spreading. You know, there's a lot of that, for example, in the banana chapter. And its uh, significance in uh, some culture or historical events. Or my personal relationship with that food item or dishes made with it. Yeah? I, uh, that, uh, in the book, I confess that I'm addicted to chocolate. Yeah? But before you know it, the food stories are somehow transformed into economic stories through what I call the Simpsons approach to storytelling. You know, old Simpsons episode with a little half a minute, one minute story in the beginning. Yeah? Very often involves uh, Bart Simpson, but you know. And Depending on the episode, that, that uh, little clip at the beginning could be crucial to the main story or may have nothing to do with the rest of it. Yeah? So it's uh, that kind of uh, storytelling. Yeah? So in the, the chapters uh, like uh, Coconut, 
An entropy of whose story is actually central to the economic story that follows. In other chapters like chicken and noodle, they have nothing to do with the, the, the real story. And more often than not, how the food story morphs uh, into the economic story is uh, like uh, traveling down the rabbit hole, to borrow a famous uh, expression from Alice in Wonderland. Yeah? You cannot predict how this is going to go. Yeah? So in the beef chapter, I start the chapter with uh, the story of uh, the, 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 the Uruguayan footballer, Luis uh, Suarez, yeah? who's a brilliant footballer, but uh, unfortunately has this habit of uh, biting other players. <laughs> but somehow it uh, the ends with the discussion of uh, the, the myth of free trade and the role of uh, World Trade Organization uh, in, in international trading system. Yeah? In the Lyme chapter, I start with uh, scurvy, a horrible disease uh, that, uh, that uh, killed many, many sailors in the past. But this chapter somehow ends with the economics of uh, climate change. Yeah? So I really cannot explain how this is done. Yeah? You have to read the book. <laughs> and yeah, along the way, I have uh, great fun with uh, all kinds of trivia, yeah? culinary, cultural, or otherwise, yeah? Sometimes these are just for fun. I mean, did you know that, that uh, Koreans, well, apart from eating the largest amount of garlic in the world, are also the biggest uh, consumers of uh, instant noodles in the world, yeah? Did you know that uh, strawberries are uh, not a berry, botanically speaking, but banana is, yeah? Yeah, so you have all kinds of uh, that, this, that, that, that. Uh, trivia, some of which actually are important, but that uh, very often uh, it's just that uh, an excuse uh, to have a fun. Well, I don't have time to go into any detail, so uh, let me kind of uh, start uh, winding up. And, uh, the book covers a very wide range of topics, you know, ranging from prejudice against Islam to the rise of robots, uh, from the meaning of economic freedom to the importance of uh, industrialization, from entrepreneurship uh, to climate change. So that, uh, in a way, it's a uh, collection of uh, different topics, but some common themes uh, emerge yeah? uh, across chapters. Yeah? So if you, I mean, like I, I would uh, uh, spend a couple of minutes at uh, that, uh, that discussing some of the these uh, common themes uh, across chapters that I think are particularly uh, interesting uh, that, or, or relevant uh, that, uh, to Malaysian readers. So in the chapters, entropy, prawn, and chocolate, I discussed uh, the importance of developing productive capabilities and upgrading the economy. You know, I've discussed that, that this uh, quite a lot with uh, the cousin of people over the years, uh, that also the, the, the long discussion with, it, uh, with uh, Hisham for the last uh, couple of days. You know, uh, Malaysia has achieved a lot in terms of you know, upgrading. Yeah? Uh, let's not forget that. Yeah? It was a that, uh, economy based on the tin mines and rubber plantation under British colonial rule. But you know it has come far. You know it that, uh, has become a major producer of uh, uh, processed uh, palm oil products, uh, the electronics, uh, the, the electrical goods. Yeah, I mean the Petronas has uh, the, the been a world leader in the, 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 the deep sea drilling technologies and the, the, you know petrochemical and so on. So you know it has achieved a lot, but uh, it has been stuck. Yeah, in this place uh, for the last decade at least, possibly two decades, yeah? you need to yeah, move, up, move ahead. Yeah? Now, a lot of people say, oh, yeah, but that, that we are just a middle income country, you know, that, that we cannot, there are all these uh, countries, you know, that, that from China, Korea, you know, Germany, US, that, that, how, how can we beat them? Yeah? 
if you take it that way, I mean, the, the, you cannot understand the, how Malaysia came up to here, yeah? because it uh, has beaten a lot of other countries coming up here. Yeah? And in the end, uh, just think about it. I mean, that is, I believe that the, the, the companies, countries, they become good at producing certain things only because they decide that they want to be. Yeah? No. Can you really give me a natural reason why Koreans and the Japanese have to be good at making cars? You know, Americans, uh, maybe you can understand because they have a lot of land, you know, they have to drive from A to B, yeah, in the shortest uh, possible time. But for God's sake, in Korea and Japan, we don't even have uh, enough land to drive around, yeah? So why are we good at making cars, yeah? For that matter, why are the Chinese, Koreans, uh, the, 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 why are they good at uh, semiconductors? Yeah? The raw material of uh, semiconductors is essentially sand, yeah? silicon. Yeah? Everyone has sand. Yeah, yeah so if uh, the, the, the raw material is important, it should be the Middle Eastern countries that should be the leaders in the semiconductors. Yeah? And a lot of things that you think are natural are not natural. Yeah? Rubber, it comes from the Amazon. The British uh, stole it from the Portuguese and brought it to Malaysia. Yeah? It's not uh, native to you. Yeah? I mean, tea, yeah? once again, the British uh, the stole it from China. Yeah? You know, the, the, from when did the, 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 the Brazil and Colombia produce coffee? Yeah? Coffee is from Africa. Yeah? And through Ar Arabic countries and Europe, it came to the Latin America the, through colonialism. Yeah? So a lot of things that you regard as natural, they're actually the products of other people's industrial policy. Yeah? So you need to open your mind, think where you want to be in 20, 30 years, and you have to work at it. And doing that, actually improving the systems is far more important than individual brilliance and efforts. Huh? So in the book, I liken it uh, to a horse race where different jockeys are competing, but one of them is riding a donkey. Huh? Another is uh, riding a thoroughbred racehorse. Huh? However skilled the, 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 the jockey riding the donkey is, he's not going to win. Huh? I mean, it, as far as uh, the, the jockey who's uh, the, the riding on the uh, thoroughbred uh, racehorse can stay on the horse, he will win. Yeah, yeah. Just, just think about it. I mean, the, 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 the people from developing countries. Yeah, I don't know Nigeria, India, Malaysia. They go to I don't know Germany, the U.S. Suddenly their productivity skyrockets. Not because they have I don't know some immersive learning program on the flight uh, to New York, but because uh, they are working with a better system, yeah? better technologies, better institutions, better organizations. Yeah? So we need to uh, uh, think about it. I mean, uh, because of this uh, individuali individualistic bias in the dominant economic frame, we always think about individuals. Yeah? But the system is far more important. Yeah? OK. I, could go on, but uh, the, we are running out of time, so let me conclude. So going back to food, you know, when it comes to food, most people agree that we should have an open mind and uh, have a varied diet, yeah? try different things, defy some culinary conventions, fuse uh, different uh, traditions. Yeah? Unfortunately, we are doing the opposite in economics. Yeah? We are insisting on one particular way of thinking. Yeah? We need to have a more varied diet of economic ideas if we are to have a healthy economy and meaningful democracy. And this is particularly important at a time like this, when almost all the old certainties are being destroyed. Yeah? You cannot understand what's going on by simply 
understanding this uh, paradigm that has built this world. Yeah? It's a crumbling, you know, climate change, new diseases, new technologies, geopolitical alignment, you name it. Yeah? The paradigm is uh, crumbling and the answers are not going to come from the ideas that built that paradigm. Yeah? You need to look at other theories. Yeah? I'm not saying that, that uh, other theories are necessarily superior, yeah? but you need to look at things from different perspectives. Yeah? You need to mix ideas. Yeah? And uh, the, with that, uh, I would uh, uh, conclude my speech. Thank you. Thank you, Arjun. Uh, for more details, background of Arjun, you can go to harjunchang.net. He has sold only 2.5 million books, Arjun. You know. So, thank you, Arjun. Uh, we have about 15 uh, minutes of so Q&As, and I'll ask two questions, and we'll take questions from, uh, from the web and from the system, and then we open the door. So, Arjun, I just want to link to to, again, uh, issue facing by the audience, CEOs, board members here. <clears throat> they are facing pressure, short-term pressure, right? Uh, as I said, we discussed, shorter returns not there, constant demand of employees in the ecosystem, beta is not there, therefore, no point of focusing alpha if your systematic risk is not getting rewarded. So, let's talk about Korea in the early 90s, I remember when I was endless, the economic profit of the listed company in Korea is zero or negative, right? So it's sort of sacrifice. The listed right. company, Chabol, but the government worked with the private companies. Now, obviously, Korea at 30 plus thousand GDP per capita, Malaysia at 11, and then we're facing Indonesia at 4,000 US dollar GDP per capita, and Vietnam, they're about, and Thailand, 7,000. So it's not easy for them. How, how, do, we, how do we help them? Yeah, I think uh, this uh, fundamental uh, trade-off uh, between the long term and the short term uh, in economic development, yeah? Because that, that, I mean, the best that, uh, trade policy in South Korea in the 1970s, say, regarding the automobile sector, would have been just to liberalize it and let people buy Japanese and American cars. Yeah? They didn't do that. So when the, the, the Korean car manu manufacturer Hyundai the first uh, started production in 1976 uh, with their own model, that they were assembling other people's cars before that, it produced 10,000 cars. Yeah? In the same year, Ford produced 1.9 million. General Motors produced uh, 4.8 million. Yeah? So if someone took a time machine and went back to 1976 and told people, look, uh, this is a tiny company in South Korea which produces 0.5% uh, of Ford, 0.2% of uh, General Motors, but give it 35 years, it will be bigger than Ford, give it 40 years, it will be bigger than General Motors what would have been the, the reaction? They would have put that person in a mental hospital. <laughs> but uh, this uh, could happen because uh, the, the Koreans accepted that, yes, uh, we are going to drive around the, in the shit cars until we can make good cars. Yeah? <laughs> so that's the trade-off, yeah? to put it very bluntly. Yeah? And yeah, you need to uh, make that kind of decision. Yeah, I'm not saying that, that, that I mean, you need to copy the Koreans or anything like that, but in order to do that, you need the, the coordination between the different actors in the economy. Yeah? Because uh, if you are the only guy who's uh, investing for the long term, you are going to the, the lose. Yeah? You all need to do it together. Yeah? And how do you create that the, the, the consensus? How do you create the, the vision that will the, the, the take uh, that uh, consensus forward, then how do you create that uh, institutional mechanisms uh, to make that uh, real? I mean, that's uh, the real challenge. Yeah? 
But yeah, reading your book, that requires a massive amount of pain. You know, if you read the book, it says that Koreans are not allowed to get a foreign passport because the government is trying to preserve uh, foreign currencies. There's no consum there was no consumer finance, which means you just save your money. When you have money, then you buy a house. You can't, so all the loan basically towards buying machineries, those kind of things. And consumer obviously has to pay higher prices sure. for somewhat inferior part then. Can this Malaysian take pain? You know? Oh. <laughs> so uh, there's a big trade off, and then I think next. No, uh, no, it's uh, the, the, the metro uh, length, lengthening uh, the time horizon because uh, we are all doing that. You know, as investors, uh, you don't. Uh, the, the, Demand a return tomorrow, yeah? yeah. You demand it uh, one year later, yeah. Can you make it uh, ten years, yeah? As a uh, parent, uh, you invest in the uh, children's education. You don't demand that that uh, that uh, now that uh, you are eleven, you have to. Oh, uh, there's a uh, CEO who's uh, eleven, so uh, there's an uh, exception. But you know, the, the parent is not going to demand that uh, you uh, bring uh, money back home, yeah. So that uh, can you apply that uh, to donation to industry, yeah? So. Actually, it's uh, the, the metro uh, lengthening the time horizon uh, because uh, we are all doing it anyway. Yeah? I mean, can you wait 10 years, no return from domestic equities? Just fixed income, government MGS. Yeah, Samsung Semiconductor never made money for 10 years. Yeah? I mean, the, the, even without the, the, uh, the, sorry, even with the, the ban on the import of uh, the foreign cars uh, the, the altogether, you know, Hyundai made it, uh, the, had, it uh, the, had difficulty uh, make, uh, making profit uh, for the first uh, 10 years of uh, uh, its uh, existence. Huh? Yeah. So anyway, this thing covered in your first book, Kicking Away the Leather. So I just didn't go back to your, your obsession or your passion, your specialization. What makes you want to focus on the I mean, economics or international economic or pluralistic approach versus the easy one, the free market, right? Quasi quoting, obviously, done something to your, your country resident now. <laughs> Why you sort of anti neoclassical or free market? Or oh, rather, you're trying to provide a different explanation, a different way mm -hmm. of looking at things. Yeah. And then, basically, free market has not been telling the truth mm -hmm. to developing countries. In a way, yeah, so. no, initially, I just uh, wanted to understand what was uh, happening to my country. Yeah? I mean, it was uh, the rather naive uh, the, the young man the, the who, you know, wanted to figure out that, you know, because that, uh, in my childhood and youth, that the country is going through huge uh, the, the transformation. Yeah? Many of them good, uh, some of them really bad. Yeah? So I wanted to understand, but that, uh, as I uh, kept uh, studying uh, development economics, I realized that this is uh, so important for human welfare. Yeah? Basically, except for, say, 100, <coughs> sorry, the, the 1 billion people who live in the rich world, I mean, everyone's uh, the, the, the existence is uh, the tough. Yeah? And the economic development is not just a matter of, I don't know, buying another iPhone or another handbag. Yeah? It's about uh, living longer, you know, when the, the, the I was born in Korea in the early 60s, the life expectancy was uh, 53, yeah? I'm 59, I should be dead, yeah? <laughs> but now it's uh, like uh, the, the 83 or something, yeah? It's about the, the not seeing your child uh, die before it reaches uh, the age of uh, four or five, yeah? Because our uh, infant mortality is very high in poor countries. It's about uh, eating another bowl of rice, you know, these things are, that are so essential for human welfare. And yeah, looking at the history, you learn that virtually no country achieved uh, the economic development solely relying on the free market and free trade. And then you begin to wonder that, uh, whether that these people you know, from uh, international financial institutions, that, uh, universities in the rich countries, are they really giving the right advice uh, the, to the developing countries? Yeah, and then I started you know, the, the, the challenging this uh, the conventional wisdom, and yeah, the fight goes on. <laughs> Thank you, Ajahn. Uh, we'll take a question. Uh, so there's a question there. So basically, I don't know. Oh, okay, there's a question. How many, 
Uh, diet that a country like Malaysia adopt, considering political will, physical capacity, and risk appetite. Sort of diversification yeah, yeah. and plus other things. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, the, in the short run, you know, the, the things, uh, the question I mentioned, uh, these are the, the quite the, the strongly binding. Yeah? So the, the, the political the reality, you know, the, the, the fiscal situation, yeah? uh, corporate uh, capacity, but the fact that they are binding in the short term doesn't mean that they have to be in the long run. Yeah? Actually, even while dealing with uh, these uh, short-term challenges, you have to constantly think about uh, the, the future. Yeah? What kind of system do we eventually want to build? Yeah? How do we get there, given these constraints? Yeah? Because that, uh, unfortunately, the, 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 the prevailing view is that uh, you basically follow market signal every day, and then somehow you will uh, get to the you know, sunny uplands. Yeah? This is uh, such a the, the insane view, isn't it, when you think about it? Because uh, just imagine that a CEO arrives in your company and says, I'm a great believer in market forces. I'm going to just react to what's uh, happening in the market on a daily basis. Yeah? You know, this guy wouldn't last a week. Yeah? Because you want uh, the, a vision and a plan to achieve that vision from the CEO. Yeah? So that's like that. I mean, that, uh, for, uh, as a nation, you need to that, that, uh, work these things out that, uh, rather than saying, well, somehow if uh, everyone does uh, what you know, that they want, that, uh, something will happen. Yeah? Okay. We can take two or three questions but if you, from the floor, but if you can ask at the same time, I mean, then I we'll get Arjun to answer. So can I have a question uh, from the floor? In the meantime, Arjun, uh, there's a question. Uh, there, saying that this is not your first time here. Uh, so, this is not your first cry to KMF Malaysian attendees to wake up and not to be complacent. Why do you think they are not waking up yet? It's anonymous. Well, I think uh, not enough uh, people are coming here. <laughs> because, uh, that, uh, yeah, I mean, that, uh, we, we all have uh, competing visions and, yeah, in the end, uh, the political system has to find a way to that, uh, kind of uh, aggregate this vision and uh, create a consensus. Only then actions uh, can happen. So, you know, a number of people thinking, oh yeah, we need to do different things. Uh, doesn't necessarily translate uh, into action. So I'm, I'm sure that it will happen that, uh, you know, because this country, as I keep saying, has already done a lot, yeah? I mean, that uh, it can do a lot more so uh, I think uh, that, uh, that shift in perspective is uh, what is needed, yeah. yeah. Any question from the floor? Yeah, it's number five. Number five. This, is that Brother Hamdan? Uh, yeah. <coughs> uh, Hajun in front. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. So while there are endogenous factors, obviously what we can do in the country. Sorry, I, uh, can, you, can speak you speak louder? Like, Bring your mic closer. Yeah. Uh, no, while there are endogenous factors, you know, meaning that what we can control in our own countries, um, but we don't work in a level playing field. Uh, we work in a kind of complex uh, global environment that is uh, divided and, and today is becoming bifurcated. Um, so how do you operate in this constrained environment, particularly trying to shape industrial policy or national development agenda when you don't have all the levers in control? So all the constraints, yep. Uh, second questions there, Any, just very quickly, running out of time. Number four, if you can ask very brief questions. So yeah, I, I, I'm quite impressed with your comment that improvements in the system are far more important than individual brilliance and efforts. But how do we reconcile the fact that we still need individuals who are brilliant to be creative to make a successful organization? So how do we reconcile yeah. the two okay. things? Okay, thank you. Thank so, you. So, so we talk about public action, yeah. syst systemic risk, yeah. and systematic risk, which That's is right. bigger than yeah. idiosyncratic. Sure, yeah. yeah. Okay, so shall I? Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Okay, on the 
global constraints. Yes, I mean that. Uh, of course, that, that uh, if you're not the U.S. or China, I mean that uh, you have to uh, kind of uh, uh, deal with this uh, the global the, the shifts and the actions by the powerful countries and so on. But you know, believe me, I mean that uh, there are a lot of things that can be done. You know, I sometimes joke that uh, the WTO has become the best uh, friend of lazy government officials in developing countries because uh, when the minister tells you to do something, all you have to do that is to tell him, sir, that is uh, banned by the WTO. You know? The minister is not going to run to the library, go through 800 uh, pages of uh, WTO treaty. You know? So the, actually, the, there are a lot of things that uh, you can do. You know, and uh, in a way, that the, 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 the good thing about that not being China or U.S. is that uh, the, a lot of uh, your actions are going to be invisible, yeah? because that uh, no one's uh, watching you all the time. Yeah? So that uh, the, you you have to uh, find a way to deal with this. As for the the, the balance between systemic uh, the changes and uh, uh, individual improvement, yeah, of course, I'm not saying that individual actions that uh, do not matter. Yeah? Because in the end, I mean, systemic changes are going to be ultimately made by collection of individuals. Yeah? So that, uh, but uh, I think uh, the important thing is that uh, to kind of persuade the individuals uh, to work together, yeah? give them incentives uh, to invest in the long term, yeah? give them uh, hope that, uh, that uh, there's uh, social mobility. Yeah? Because once uh, they give up, well, th 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 there's no way I can improve myself, then the system uh, ossifies, yeah? and then that uh, you will be, yeah? I mean, this is what is uh, happening in Britain. Yeah? The same class of people from a couple of schools, you know, Eton, Winchester, yeah? they've been that, that running uh, the place for decades, hundreds of years, and that, uh, now that, that they have run out of ideas. Yeah? So the finance minister, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, basically has uh, become, yeah? A subscriber to what Latin Americans call magical realism. Yeah, yeah you, you will that, that say these things, and some other things will happen. Yeah? So I think it's uh, important to uh, create that, uh, that uh, hope uh, for the future for the individuals, so that, uh, that, that uh, enough people will strive uh, to, if you like, uh, inject uh, fresh ideas and fresh uh, that, that, that experiences uh, into the system. And yeah, I'll have to leave it there. Thank you. Arjun, we ran out of time. Yeah. So just very quickly to give you a plug. On Wednesday morning at 10.30 at Kinokuniya, you'll be there yeah. uh, sort of explaining the book. So 10.30 Wednesday. And Hamdan, when is your public speech in Penang again? What day? Friday? What time? 12 o'clock in Penang. No, 10 o'clock. Uh, 10 o'clock, OK. So if you want to listen more to Hajun, but Hajun, maybe just f my suggestion to your book, you hinted a you mm -hmm. uh, number of things for Malaysian chapter. I see. Uh, bitter God, <laughs> you know, uh, Chia Ku, you know, in China, eat bitterness. What would you write in that, again, a summary in that chapter on bitter God? Well, yeah, bitter things uh, that are often very good, yeah? I mean, medicine, they are usually bitter, yeah? <laughs> bitter gourd, I love uh, bitter gourd, yeah? I, I love uh, the coffee uh, and red wine because they are bitter, so, you know, yeah, you uh, might find these things that are a bit kind of uh, difficult in the beginning, yeah. but there'll be a lot of good uh, once you begin to, yeah, take these things, so. So, <laughs> can we Malaysian eat bitterness, so essentially? So anyway, on that note, join me to thank Hajun Chang you know, for a brilliant session. Thank you.